I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. You say, geez, preacher, that's the third time today you've asked us to turn in our Bibles. Let me tell you, there's not a more important thing I could say today than turn in your Bible because God's Word is authoritative, uh, it is true, and so we're going to Acts chapter 13, uh, starting in verse 13. Uh, I want to get us up to there because we spent some time in Acts 13 already looking at Paul's first missionary journey. And I just, I wasn't that creative this week with my sermon title, so I just titled it The Journey Continues, right? Because we get to see more of the missionary journey. Uh, We get to see it take place uh, and migrate to another territory in Asia Minor or what is modern day Turkey. Uh, And so we'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, But just to go back and recap, we've already looked at the calling that took place at the Church of Antioch, how they were commissioned, and then we looked at how uh, the Holy Spirit played a sovereign role in uh, calling out Paul and Barnabas, equipping them, and then having the church affirm them, and then he even uh, played the role of sending them out. The church was submitting to his leadership, and the church sent them out on their first missionary journey. Then what we saw later on in the first 12 verses is that when they made it uh, to Cyprus, they were sharing the gospel with everyone they come in contact with, and they met some resistance. So we took some time to, to focus on that conflict that took place while Paul was sharing the gospel with the governor of Paphos. And so where the text picks up today is they're leaving the island of Cyprus and they're traveling on in their missionary journey. And what we have recorded is the very first sermon that, uh, as we know of, that Paul preached. It is the longest recorded sermon, but it's the first one recorded in Scripture in Paul's ministry uh, as a missionary for Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to ask you to stand. We normally stand for the honor, honor of reading of God's Word. I'm going to read a lot of this passage today. So I just want you to focus, honor in your hearts, and focus on it. We're going to read from verse 13 all the way to verse 41, because there's no sense in us breaking his sermon apart and not reading it all. We need to see what he, uh, what he declared, uh, and then we'll go back and look at why he covered what he did. All right, so I want you to do something right quick. I want you to uh, raise your hand if you know, I'm all about hands raised today, right? If you know for sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, and I don't want you to just raise your hand because the person beside you raised their hand. I got a specific purpose in doing this. But if you know for sure beyond any sign of doubt that if you died today, you would be in heaven because of your relationship with Jesus, would you raise your hand? All right, so here's what I want to do. I want you to put your hands down. There, there's two categories here today. There, and I, I couldn't look around and see who didn't have their hands raised. But there's a group that raised their hand, and there's a group that didn't. There's a group that knows for sure today that if they died, they would spend eternity in heaven because of what Jesus did for them. And then there's a group that's not sure. Paul addresses both groups today with the group that raised their hand. What you're going to see today is all of the evidence that points to Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promise to redeem his people. You're going to see evidence upon evidence, and, and you're going to be, uh, it's going to be verified in your faith that Jesus really is who he said he is. And, and when I'm telling people about him, these are some things that I need to include in that. For those of you that didn't raise your hand because you don't have that eternal confidence that if you died today, you would spend eternity in heaven, maybe because you're not sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus and he's the only way, what you're going to see today is he really is the one that God promised to sin, to redeem us from our sins. And you're also going to see that there are two reactions in Paul's sermon. He addresses both of them. Reaction number one, surrendering to him, believing he is who he says he is, and worshiping him and being forgiven and justified. Reaction number two, scoffing at the the preaching of Christ and being condemned in a sinner's hell. Both of those are true, and it all hinges on what we do with the person of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 13, praying that, that both audiences today hear that Jesus really is the answer. 
It says, now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga and they came to Antioch in Pisidia, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Uh, I, I just want to stop right there. Brother David, you can relate to this with me. If you're sitting in the audience and the person on the stage says, is there anybody here that would like to preach? Man, I'm going to jump all over that, amen? And so we see why Paul responded the way he did. You're always sitting on go when you got a word from the Lord. And it says in verse 16, Paul stood up and he motioning with his hands, he said, and he began to preach. And he says, men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The word of this people Israel chose our, or the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After, they, after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up from them David as king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John the first pre had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they, had, they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which are were, are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. They didn't know him, but they fulfilled what they read in condemning him. And though they, they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and was seen, he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he has raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in, a, in another psalm, Psalm 16, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation, by the will of God fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God has raised up, saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Habakkuk 1.5 says, Behold, you despisers, Marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you.
Father, as we look at this sermon today, preached by the Apostle Paul to the Jews and Gentiles that were gathered in the synagogue there in Asia Minor, we ask, Lord, that you minister to us today around the person of Jesus Christ. Validate in our hearts that he is the one you promised to send. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here today that has not placed their faith and trust in him, that today would be the day that they would see him as the redemption, the justifier, uh, the one who has forgiven them and paid the price for their sins to, to set them free in Christ. Lord, do a work through your Holy Spirit as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to go back and do a couple of geographical references this morning. It's been one of my favorite things to see how we can use geography to validate the authenticity of this story, of what's been recorded. And so I got a a map to show you. If you could put that map on the wall, it shows you where the Apostle Paul went on his first missionary journey. We've already talked about how he left Antioch and went to Cyprus and he visited the entire island because the cities are referenced on the eastern side and the western side. But now if you look at verse 13, he leaves the island of Cyprus and he heads north across the Mediterranean Sea to what we know as Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. The city of Perga would have been the harbor on the bottom side of Asia Minor and that's that's where they would have... uh, That's where the ship would have landed as it traveled north. So they get to Perga, and if you keep reading in verse 13, it says that uh, John, or John Mark, did not go with them. All right, so when they leave Cyprus, or they leave Paphos on the west side of Cyprus, they go north, John Mark goes east, right? He went home. We don't know why he went home. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speculate on three reasons here. I put all three in your notes. Here, here's my three speculations, and I'm going to stand over here away from the pulpit for a moment because this, this is me speaking, all right? Speculation number one, he got homesick, all right? Been on a missionary journey. We don't know exactly how long they were in Cyprus. This was his first journey with Barnabas, who was likely his cousin, and Paul, whom he hadn't known very long. So maybe he's homesick. Speculation number two, the journey into Asia Minor was going to be more difficult because the terrain was more difficult. It's a mountainous region. But not only was it more difficult geographically and and going to be very strenuous, it was also dangerous to travelers. We know that the the stretch between uh, the harbor and Uh, where they were going was known for a lot of crime. Travelers were attacked during that time. And so maybe John Mark got, uh, he got scared. And he says, I don't want to go through that. This is not what I signed up for. I'm going back home. I'm going to give you a third reason though. And it's actually in the text. Look at how verse 13 begins. This is the first time that the journey has been described as Paul and those who were with him. All right, up until this point, even as recent as verse 7, who was referenced as the leader of the crowd? It was Barnabas, right? And Barnabas went and got Saul, and Barnabas brought Saul with him. It appears now, and it stays this way through the rest of Acts, that there's been a change in leadership. What generally happens when there's a change in leadership? There's some people that don't like it, right? And, it, and maybe he, uh, I'm, I'm still speculating, maybe he got his feelings hurt because his cousin's no longer the one in charge, and so he's going to take his ball and go home. Whatever the reason is, guess what? If you go two chapters later, Paul was upset about it. He did not like the fact that John Mark did not go with them up to Asia Minor to continue this missionary journey. And so turn over to chapter 15, And look at verse 36. It's it's important to put these pieces of the puzzle together because this story is unfolding as we walk our way through the book of Acts. If you look at verse 36, it says, Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. 
Makes sense, right? Let's backtrack. Let's go back through to the churches that we've planted, the people that we've seen come to faith, the, the believers that we encourage. Let's see how they're doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. And Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. So Paul was a little upset that John Mark had left. For whatever reason he left, we don't know. But we know that Paul was a little bit upset about it. Then the contention became so sharp that that Paul and Barnabas departed from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and they sailed to Barnabas' homeland in Cyprus. All right, so we've got a split that just happened between Paul and Barnabas, and it's over John Mark, Paul being upset for why he left in the first place, John Mark wanting to include him again, Paul saying we couldn't depend on him then, how can we depend on him now? And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God, and while Barnabas and Mark went to Cyprus, Paul and Silas went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So he went on about his journey. So we don't know why John Mark left. We, we speculate a couple of things, but we know Paul didn't like it. And when they left Perga to travel north, it says that they traveled to a city in verse 14, and you'll see it on the map, a city named Pisidian Antioch. The reason why it's, it's called Pisidian Antioch on the map is so that you don't confuse it with the Antioch from where this journey began. There's actually three different cities in the Bible named Antioch. Okay, so don't, don't get them confused. He's not backtracking yet. He's going to a different Antioch, which is in Pisidia. This Antioch is 135 miles. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, my wife and, and Miss Kitty, they go hiking 100 miles or something on the Appalachian Trail every summer. This would have been enough for me to go home, like John Mark, right? We're about to sail to Perga, and then we're going to hike 135 miles. And not only is it 135 miles inland to what we call Turkey today, but Pisidian Antioch is 3,500 feet above sea level. So they are hiking uphill, 135 miles. And I want to give you... Another piece of the puzzle, I I hope what happens for you is what happened to me as I'm studying this. Uh, Let it all start to come together. This is the region known as Galatia. Sound familiar? So the letter that Paul is later going to write that we have in our Bible called Galatians is written to the churches in this area that they are ministering to on this first missionary journey. And we're going to use Galatians today as some cross-references, partly because it's written to the same people. While Paul is preaching there, uh, the letter that he later writes there. It says when they get to Pisidian Antioch, the first place they went, which was customary for them, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sat down. Now in, in first century synagogues, here's the order of service. All right, first you're going to have an opening prayer. After the opening prayer, you're going to have someone get up, uh, one of the uh, members of the Sanhedrin, one of the religious, the Jewish religious leaders in that area, they're going to get up and they're going to read from the book of the law, which is known as the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. After that person reads from the book of the law, then you're going to have somebody else get up and they're going to read from the prophets, which are the books that, that followed the law, right, in our Old Testament. Then... And you're seeing all this unfold right here for Paul and Barnabas. After somebody reads from the book of the law, and then somebody reads from the book of the prophets, then they look out into the audience, and if they find an educated man, they invite him to come up and talk about what was just read. So now it should make perfect sense. Why did Paul's sermon start in the Old Testament? Why did it start in the law? Why did it start as early as Genesis It's because that's what he had been asked to speak about. It's to get up and stand in front of the people who have just heard the law read, who have just heard the prophets read, and then here, come. His testimony evidently had made it there ahead of him. Come and talk about what we just read. And what does Paul do? He says, it's about Jesus. Amen? No matter where you're reading in the scripture, it's about Jesus. And we're going to 
see that as we uh, kind of quickly work our way through Paul's sermon this morning. So all that I just said about the synagogue service, look at verse 15. And after the reading of the law and the reading of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, talking about Paul and his party, saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation, now understand there, if you have any word to say about what we just read, that's what would have been understood, for the people, then we want you to share that word, say on. And Paul uh, took the invitation, he stood up, and motioning with his hand, he said. Now this sermon that we've read, I'm not going to read it again, but I, I do encourage you to go back after we've kind of surveyed it to read it again and things will jump off the page at you Uh, but it's broken into three parts he he must have been a Baptist preacher you got to have three points in a sermon and and so it's broken into three parts and each part starts with addressing his audience so every time he starts a new point he labels who he's talking to he says Jewish leaders and those who are friendly to Judaism right Jewish leaders and the Gentiles in the room that look favorably upon the preaching and the reading and the worship of the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. So he addresses them. His first address happens right here in verse 16 when he says, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. So that's how you can pick up on the three categories of Paul's sermon is just watch for that introduction. Men of Israel and those who fear God, Uh, Jewish leaders, and those who favor Judaism. Uh, And Paul begins with point number one in verse 17 of God gave a promise in the beginning. So the points of of Paul's sermon today uh, that he spoke to the Jews and the Gentiles in that synagogue in Pisidian Antioch was God gave a promise, God fulfilled that promise, and that promise demands a response. So who's the fulfillment of the promise of redemption that was given as early as Genesis? His name is Jesus. And that's who we're here worshiping today. Paul gives a survey of Israel's history as he's pointing to Jesus. And so I just want to kind of lump verses 17 through 22 together and just show you that he is, he's going from the very beginning with the promise that God made to Abraham And he's working his way all the way to David so that he could point to Jesus. So quick history lesson for the people there. They just read about it in the Law of the Prophets. Verse 17, God chose his patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? We know those. Uh, God delivered his people out of Egypt in verse 17. God even put up with his people during their 40 years of wilderness wanderings as they went through the wilderness Uh, In verse 18, and then in verse 19, there was a conquest of the promised land. So in one verse, in verse 19, Paul summarizes the book of Joshua and the book of Numbers. If you look at verse 19, that is what is taking place in those books, that when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. It's the inheritance that was given out to the numbered tribes of Israel as they go into the promised land. And we've got the conquest uh, and the battles that Joshua uh, is about, the book of Joshua. Then in verse 20, you've got the uh, 450 years of judges, which are governors. And during that time, the people start to grumble and complain. And what are they complaining about? All the other nations around us have a king. And here we have these judges. We want a king. And God was like, I'm your king. They're like, no, we want a king like everybody else has a king. And God says, okay, I'll give you a king. And he gives them Saul. Uh, So we have that in verse 21, the establishment of the monarchy. After he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And if you look in your Old Testament Bible, uh, you'll see Paul's just working his way through. Because what comes next? First and second Samuel, right? Uh, so he's, he's working his way through the, the Old Testament to point. He's got a very specific purpose in doing this. And then verse 21. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. 
Cool thing about the history of Israel, this is the only location in all of Scripture that we're able to find out how long Saul's reign was before David became king. We don't find it in 1 Samuel when he becomes king. Uh, We find it here in Acts 13 that he served 40 years and then God removed him. And if you want to know why he removed him, uh, I've got it in the notes there. We're not going to turn to it. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, there's a reason why God removed Saul from the king, being the king of Israel, and it's because Saul disobeyed God in the order in which he was supposed to do things. You do not go to battle with my people until my prophet has come and spoke a book of blessing over you. And what does Saul do? Saul takes things into his own hands, and he speaks the blessing over them by himself. Samuel shows up and says, why have you done this? This is evil that you have done, and because of that, God is going to remove his covenant blessing from you as the king of Israel, and he's going to give it to someone who is a man after his own heart. And guess what that guy's name is? King David. So so what Paul's doing here is he's trying to get from Abraham to David so that he can then get from David to Jesus, which is his ultimate goal the whole time. I want to tell you about Jesus. You just read from the Old Testament. I'm going to show you how the Old Testament points to Jesus. And in verse 23, it says, From this man, well, let me, let me read verse 22 as well. And when he had removed Saul, when God removed Saul, he raised up for them David as king, And it was going to be from David, his lineage, that Jesus was going to come. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And look at verse 23. From this man's seed, according to the promise that I gave, God raised up for Israel a Savior, and his name is Jesus. It all leads to Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. When you're reading in the scriptures, whether you find yourself at Genesis, whether you find yourself in Samuel, whether you find yourself in Malachi or Acts or Revelation, guess who you're reading about? You're reading about Jesus. It's the story of Jesus, a promise given, a promise fulfilled, and a response to that promise. That is the theme of the Bible. Uh, Why is it called history? Because it's his story, right? Everything that happens. So what does that mean for us? We currently find ourselves between the two advents, the two comings of Christ. We have where he came, born of a virgin, uh, lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death so that sinners like us could go to heaven, and now we're waiting on his return. So we find ourselves between the two advents. Let me ask you this. Is there anything different about right now in the carrying out of God's history from what he did in the scriptures? No. It all still points to Jesus. Why do we need to believe that? We need to have the hope today that what's happening around us is not messing up God's plan. It's a part of his plan. Right? Jesus is still going to return. Jesus is still building his church. Jesus is still uh, using his people to minister to uh, the world. All these things are still happening according to the way that God wants them to happen. So just as we watch Paul unfold this history and point to Jesus, we need to be doing that now with what we're going through. How does this point to Jesus? And I show you uh, the genealogy of Jesus if you read it in Matthew chapter 1. There's one particular verse that's put there just to show you that these genealogies perfectly line up to point to Jesus. And he uses the same references that Paul used. Abraham to David to Jesus. And, and it says in Matthew 1.17, all the generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations. All the generations from David until the captivity of Babylon, 14 generations. And all the generations from the captivity of Babylon until Christ, 14 generations. Abraham, David, Jesus. It was all for a special purpose. And that purpose is Jesus. The promise is Jesus. As Paul transitions from the promise being given to the promise being fulfilled, he then uses two groups as examples. He uses John the Baptist and he uses the religious leaders. 
He uses John the Baptist as an example of someone who believed Jesus was who he really was. He responded accordingly and he prepared others to meet him. That's what we should be doing, right? We believe he is who he says he is. We uh, recognize his holiness in the way that we worship him and we prepare others to meet him. That's what John the Baptist did. But then he used the religious leaders to say there was not, not everyone was excited about this Jesus. There were many who rejected him. And so look at uh, verse 24. It says, After John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So he's using John as an example here. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Loosing a person's sandals is the lowest task of a lowly slave. And it's so low. And and we need to know this because we need to know what, what Paul just said here. It's so low that there was a rule put in place during Jesus' day that a rabbi was not allowed to ask one of his disciples to loose his sandals because it was too demeaning. It was too insulting. It was too lowly of a task for a rabbi to, to take advantage of his authority and require one of his disciples, one of his pupils, to loose the sandals of his or the, the, the laces of his sandals. And so what does John the Baptist say? When it comes to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to do that. What causes that kind of mindset? Is that the kind of mindset you would have today if, if you were standing face to face with the person of Jesus and you fall flat on your face in worship and say, I'm not even worthy to do the lowest task of the lowest slave. I'm not even worthy to be in your sight right now. What causes that kind of reaction? And I'll tell you what does. It's when we recognize the character of the one we're standing in front of. It's when we recognize how holy this God really is. Think about Isaiah 6. Think about when Isaiah saw the the hem or the robe of God's garment filling the temple and your robe signified how powerful, how much territory you own, how majestic you were in it. And this robe filled the temple and his glory was all around him. And what's Isaiah's response to that in Isaiah 6? Woe is me, for I am undone. I am unclean and I live among an unclean people. I'm not even worthy to be here, right? What causes that kind of reaction is when you see Jesus for who he really is. Is. And I'm going to tell you what will materialize in your life when you see Jesus for who he really is. Right? You'll take obedience more seriously. You will take worship more seriously. You will take following after him and being more like him more seriously because you recognize who it is that you serve. That's what John the Baptist said. I can't, I'm not even worthy to loose his sandals. Which brings us to the second part of Paul's sermon. Uh, when he says, Jesus, who John the Baptist felt this way about, is the fulfillment of the promise that God gave Abraham. And in verse 26, he t- after addressing his audience again, he says to you, the word of this salvation has been sent. This past Wednesday night, we, uh, in the adult Bible study, Pastor David led us through a sermon on the the parable of the sower and how the seed of salvation has been broadcasted and it has fallen on four different soils and it's getting four different responses. And we know it's the work of salvation, the work of the Holy Spirit in the soil to fertilize it and to cause it to spring up and cause growth and fruit of salvation. But but Paul kind of alludes to that. He says, the word of this promise fulfilled has been given to all of you. And there's been various reactions. There's been reactions like John the Baptist, and there's been reactions like the religious leaders. And so Paul goes ahead and addresses two questions before they're asked in verse 27. Question number one, if Jesus is God's promised Messiah, 
then why did the Jewish leaders reject him? And question number two, did their rejecting him and killing him mess up God's plan? You need to know the answer to those questions. These are rebuttals that are being given. Did their rejection cause him not to be the one God promised, and did it mess up God's plan? And if you look at what Paul does with that, for the, in verse 27, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which they just read in the synagogue, they actually fulfilled them by condemning him. So let me tell you how big of a God that we serve. Not only did their rejection, boy, I'm excited about this. Not only did their rejection not mess up God's plan, it fulfilled it. It fulfilled God's plan. The rejection that, that led to the trials and the beatings, and he even says in his sermon, he, y'all couldn't even find a reason to execute him. So you convinced Pilate to, to sentence him anyway. And what were you doing the whole time? You were fulfilling God's plan because he needed to die on that cross. John 5, 39 through 40 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. This is Jesus speaking. You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. These these scriptures that you just read in the synagogue of the law and the prophets, they point to Jesus. And instead of rejection messing up God's plan, it fulfilled it. And Paul says, you have fulfilled that which you have read. God's providential power is always at work. It's at work in your life. It it was at work in Jesus' life. It was at work in the religious leaders' lives as they were rejecting the Messiah. And if you look at verse uh, 29, the providence continues. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him. One of the things that jumps off the page me there is think about when Jesus died and they were discussing what to do with his garments. You remember that conversation? Uh, the, the soldiers were discussing what to do with his garments. And one of them said, let's just tear them up and, and divide them. And another one says, no, we need to cast lots for them. And then it gets recorded in the scripture. The reason they needed to cast lots for them is because that's what the prophecy said they would do. Right? So they were carrying out the prophecy and fulfilling the prophecy. This is God's providential power. Uh, They took him down from the, and Paul didn't say cross. He said tree. And laid him in a tomb. Why did he say tree? Because Deuteronomy 21 says, Verses 22 through 23 says, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a what? A tree. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he... This is important. Who is hung on a tree is accursed by God. Paul says, you took his body, you put him on a tree, and then you took him off the tree, and you put him in a tomb. Jesus was cursed so that you could be blessed. In a letter written to this same church, Galatians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, and how did he do that? For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. All of that was built into what Paul was preaching here. And then... Paul uses some of the most magnificent words that are found in Scripture. And it's just two words. Look at the start of that next verse, verse 30. But God. I'm going to tell you something. Anytime you see those two words in Scripture, you better stop. Make sure you got plenty of time because you're about to see God do something amazing. He's about to interrupt 
the flow of man's plans and show that it was his plan all along. And so look at verse 30 because this is what Paul focuses on for the rest of his sermon, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But God raised Jesus who was accursed by hanging him on a tree. You took him off the tree, you put him in a tomb and God raised him from the dead. Paul is famous for using the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I want you to hear this today because let me tell you one thing that sets your savior apart from all of the other religion, religions in the world. Yours is alive. He's alive because God raised him from the dead. And use that truth, the truth of Jesus' resurrection, to single him out from every other supposed deity that exists in man's mind. The resurrection is used to validate Jesus' identity as a fulfillment of God's promise. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 And look at Paul's introduction in this letter at how he uses the resurrection to validate Jesus' identity. We need to make much of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 1 of Romans 1, uh, the very next book to the right, it says, Paul, a, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. The resurrection from the dead is what validates Jesus as the fulfillment of the promise. And then Paul goes into listing several psalms that say that. He quotes Psalm 27 in verse 33. He quotes Isaiah 55 3 in verse 35. He quotes Psalm 16 10 in uh, or that's in verse 35, and then he, he quotes Psalm 16, 10 in verses 36 and 37 to all say that what David wrote about a thousand years ago was pointing to Jesus. One of the evidences he gives is Psalm 16, 10 talks about his promised one would not see corruption, and then Paul adds to that, David died and was put in a tomb and he decayed. He saw corruption. So it's obvious that Psalm 1610 wasn't talking about David. It was talking about Jesus. Now, I want to insert a question that leads us to Paul's last point. What are you going to do with this Jesus? I want you to think about that. Look at verse 38. Paul demands a response. Acts 13, 38. Therefore, Let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man who was raised from the dead, he was hung on a tree, he was cursed for you so that you could be blessed, you took him off the tree, you put him in a tomb, God raised him out of the tomb, and it is through this man that is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. By him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. I asked you earlier to raise your hand if you were perfectly sinless and nobody raised their hand. We look at the law, we understand that the demand of the law is perfection and that anyone who breaks the law suffers the punishment of breaking the law, which is death. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That involves all of us. So the justification that the law could not bring us, justified means declared not guilty. Justified means being declared perfectly righteous. Justified means you never broke the law, not once in your entire life. Because James 2 says, if you broke one of them, you've broken all of them. We cannot be justified by the law. We all stand condemned by the law. And so what the law could not provide us, Jesus has provided for us, justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, I'm going to stop right there because he also highlights another response 
in just a moment. So what he says here is God offers forgiveness of sins and justification, being declared not guilty. I've even heard it say, just as if you never sinned. He offers that to everyone who believes in this Jesus. If you put your faith and trust in the one true God, or or the one whom God raised from the dead, you will be justified. You will be declared perfectly righteous. Why? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our only hope for standing before God is to have the righteous garment of Christ. It's to have your sin garment taken off and having it put on Christ and Christ cursed for it by being hung on a tree taken off that tree, put in a tomb, conquering death, being raised from the dead so that he could give you the garment of righteousness. And the only way you can be justified from the sins that you have committed is if you believe in this Jesus who was cursed on your behalf. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for the works of the law, of the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Can I I plead with you to not believe in the deceived teaching of Satan that exists in our world today, that as long as your good outweighs your bad, you'll be in heaven when you die? That is not true. Something has to be done with the bad that you have committed in order for God to remain a just judge. And he dealt with the bad and its consequences by putting it on Jesus. And if you don't believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin, you're going to pay that price yourself. So look at verse 40. Because Paul Paul includes that in his response as well. Beware, there's a warning here. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in what you just heard read come upon you. Because Habakkuk 1.5 says, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you by, by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So what we're faced with today in looking at Paul's sermon is, will you believe in Jesus as the fulfillment of the promise and be justified, or will you reject him as the religious leaders did and be condemned? That's what we all face. You will either trust that Jesus is the one, and you know it because he's the one God raised from the dead, and that he was a curse so that you could be blessed, or you will reject him, and you will experience that curse yourself. It's only appropriate that God do that, right? If somebody committed a crime against you, you want the judge to punish them for that crime. Well, your sin was committed against God. It's only right that he would bring punishment for the sin that you've committed. So will you suffer that punishment yourself? Or will you accept that Jesus paid it for you and be justified as if you never committed it? I want you to bow your heads. Christopher and his team is going to come back up to lead us in why it's so important to trust in the name of Jesus. But while they're coming, I want you to just think. You raised your hand earlier, kind of putting yourself in what category you're in. You you have faith in Christ. You're assured that if you died today, you would go to heaven. Why? Why Jesus? Paul gave us sufficient evidence. But maybe maybe you raised your hand uh, because you didn't want to be seen without raising it, or you chose not to raise your hand. I hope today, in your heart, the Holy Spirit has shown you who Jesus is and why you need him. Those who trust in Christ will be justified. Those who reject him 
will be condemned. Father, hear our prayers this morning. Anyone who has the affirmation, the, the assurance of salvation, I pray today that you have used Paul's sermon to equip us in the necessary details when we're sharing the gospel with others of how to single Jesus out as the fulfillment of your promise and the only way unto salvation. And I also pray today that if there's anyone here today that that does not know him personally, maybe they believe that he he's real and that he did come and do what the Bible says he did, but there's nothing personal about it. May your Holy Spirit make it personal today. That they would see that that curse that was put on him was their curse. That that conquering of death was their death. And that the eternal life that he brings through the resurrection is for them. And that his righteousness clothes them so that they can stand acceptable in your sight. Your Holy Spirit has to do all of that. We trust you to do your work in this place. As we sing of the importance of trusting in Jesus, may you hear the prayers of our hearts, uh, those initiated by the Holy Spirit, the ministry you're doing in the hearts of the people here. Receive glory from it. In Jesus' name.